it's Emily with Lowell Parks and Conservation Trust. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you how I created this solitary bee hotel specifically designed for mason bees. My design features a removable back panel and parchment paper inserts for better management. For this project, you'll need a block of wood that's at least three inches deep up to about six inches. My block here is about a little over four inches deep. Um, it, the block could be any size as long as you have enough space in between the holes that you're drilling. I would recommend three quarters of an inch to an inch apart. Uh, today, the holes I'm going to be drilling are going to be three eighths of an inch. Um, they can be as small as a quarter inch in diameter. Uh, we are looking to attract mason bees, and uh, female mason bees prefer holes that are just a little bit bigger than their bodies. For this project, we'll also be using a removable back panel, and I'll explain why we'll be doing this later in the video. And we'll need a drill with an extra long drill bit. Let's get started! Plan where you'd like to drill your holes using a pencil, and drill your holes straight through your wood block. to have had access to a full shop, so I used a drill press to finish drilling the holes in my block of wood. That being said, this is unnecessary and can be completed with an extra long drill bit. The drill press didn't make it all the way through my block of wood, so here I am finishing up those holes. If you don't plan on adding removable inserts to your bee hotel, you can stop drilling at this point so that your holes don't go all the way through. So jumping ahead in the timeline a little bit, I've finished drilling the holes into our block of wood. The holes go all the way through and they're about an inch to a quarter inch apart. Um, I've done the unnecessary step, step of sanding the front of it down, but you don't have to do that. Um, I will be actively managing these bees and what that means is not only is, am I creating habitat for them, I'm going to be removing the larva come fall via these parchment tubes that are going to be in, in these little holes um, through this removable back panel and I'm going to be managing for potential mites and parasitic wasps and hope to um, support the mason bee population. Let's take a break and talk about what will go on inside the bee hotel. The female mason bee lays her eggs in cells divided by mud partitions and plugs the entrance up with a mud stopper. The eggs are laid on a mound of pollen that become food for the larvae once they hatch. The larvae overwinter in their cocoons and hatch in the early spring, with the males first and the females second. The male mason bees emerge first and wait for the female mason bees to emerge from their nests. Their sole purpose is to mate and die shortly after. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a piece of parchment paper that's about a little over an inch, um, that's slightly longer than the block of wood that you will be using, and twist it around a screwdriver or a pencil, slip them in the holes, so that it comes out the other side. Line it up to the entrance and then knock the pencil or screwdriver out and you'll have a bunch of tails sticking out the back and we'll deal with those in a second. These parchment tubes are also helpful so you don't have to re-drill the holes every season. You can just clean it out by removing the parchment and replacing them. So now, once your holes are all filled with the parchment, we are going to close off the ends by angling them down. And this is so if water gets between the wood block and your back panel, it won't go into the bee's nesting area. Now it's time to screw on your removable back panel. So 
after we've screwed on the back piece, we're going to attach a little piece of wood, just a scrap piece of wood to the top portion of the back. And this is because we want this, when it's hung up, to be angled down so that when it rains, water doesn't flow into uh, the nesting cavities. And there you have it. This is my finished bee hotel. I've added two loops on the side to hang up and I'll make sure to be hanging this in an unobstructed area in the sunlight facing southeast. As a bonus, here is a more simple bee hotel I made out of invasive Japanese knotweed stalks. Thanks for watching! Trailing Arbutus, also known as the Mayflower, is the state flower of Massachusetts. Despite its obvious ties to the Mayflower ship, which carried the pilgrims to our rocky coasts in 1620, it was only accepted as our state flower in 1918. In fact, bills in 1900 and 1901 designating the flower as our official state flower were defeated. So 17 years later, they decided to leave the choice up to our wisest Massachusetts citizens, a class of first graders. They voted between Trailing Arbutus and arguably a much showier flower, the water lily. Trailing Arbutus won by a ratio of two to one. And Trailing Arbutus has been our state flower ever since. Trailing Arbutus is in the Heath family. This plant is characterized by broad oval shaped leaves and white or pale pink trumpet shaped flowers. It can also trail for 15 feet despite only being four to six inches high. I hope you enjoyed learning about our state flower. I enjoyed sharing with you. Do you agree with the first grade class who chose trailing Arbutus in 1918? If not, what flower would you have picked and why? Let us know in the comments below. My name is Emily and I'm an environmental educator at Lowell Parks and Conservation Trust. Today I'll be showing you how I created this event map of one of our beautiful conservation lands, Hawk Valley Farm. Event mapping is a type of nature journaling first coined by naturalist Hannah Hinchman. Stay tuned if you're interested in learning more about Hawk Valley Farm or this form of nature journaling. When you arrive at Hawk Valley Farm, you are greeted by our entrance sign. At this point in the year, ferns surround the sign, as well as a variety of wild violets, both blue and white. All these flowers attract pollinators, including our friends the bumblebee, whose scientific name is Bombus impatiens, which fits them perfectly. path you'll come across some structures. Who lives here? What are they for? Listening closely you'll hear a soft buzz. These are honeybee hives. These hives can host anywhere from 10,000 to well over 60,000 bees and each hive only has one queen. If you venture far enough down the path, you'll come across our Lowell Parks and Conservation Birdhouse. Have you seen our birdhouse at Hawk Valley Farm? At this point in the year, one of the more noticeable plants at Hawk Valley Farm is called Bloodroot. Bloodroot is part of the poppy family. A single bloodroot leaf and flower each rise on a separate stem. The white flower of the bloodroot plant opens in the full sunlight during the day and closes itself at night. Event maps are in some ways the opposite of traditional botanical illustration. 
Instead of picking out one species by itself and studying its components in ecology, you are looking at a bigger, if not whole, system. Where scientific illustration has traditional rules, event mapping does not. As you can see, my event map included drawings, observation, as well as little poems. It can be anything you want. Therefore, event mapping is perfect for any age naturalist. It allows you to slow down and look closely at the world around them by noticing these specific events. These events can be as seemingly insignificant as a bumblebee flying by, or maybe noticing that the violets are blooming in two different colors. But by questioning why these events occur and why they're happening in this specific natural area, we learn a lot about plant and animal biology through asking these questions. Creating event maps will allow you to keep a moment in time of your favorite natural areas. Thank you for joining me today as I created this event map for Hawk Valley Farm. If you create event maps or nature journal pages for any of our natural areas, please send them in. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more journaling content. Today at Lowell Parks and Conservation Trust, we will be making eight page nature journals. To do this, you will need a pair of scissors, a single piece of scrap paper, and some markers. Not pictured in the video, but you will also need a stapler, tape, or a hole punch with some string to tie the pages together. First, you cut the paper in half on the long side, folding again on the long side of the two pieces you cut. Now it's time to staple along the seam. Your final product should end up looking like this. Here are some example nature journals made by our friends at Merkland Elementary School. As you can see, they made tracking books using stamps. Today, I'll be showing you how to make a simple tracking book using markers. I will be using this guide but you can use the examples I show you or look up pictures online. Our first track will be an animal with two toes. A moose has two toes, but we want one that we see around Lowell, so I'm going to be using the white-tailed deer track. three toes. This one's a bit tricky, but birds have three toes. We'll be using the wild turkey print. Next is an animal with four toes. We have some options here. A coyote has four toes, but so does a lynx and a bobcat. Their prints are pretty similar, but can you see the difference? In prints in the dog family, you can see the claws. But from the cat family, they retract their claws. And so you don't usually see them in the print. The last animal we'll add to our book today is an animal with five toes. I chose to do the raccoon. Keep in mind that the raccoon has a different front paw and back paw. joining us today at Lowell Parks and Conservation Trust. Keep in mind that these journals can be used for more than tracking, but for anything. If you end up making some pocket journals of your own, make sure to send us some pictures. Bye! Hello, 
it's Emily with Lowell Parks and Conservation Trust. Today I am at the Davidson Street location of the Greenway Park System. Uh, we are going to be looking at this beautiful riverine habitat as well as some of the plants and animals that call this place home. We will be creating an event map together and also talking about some of the larger projects we have going on for the future for this Greenway. The Concord River Greenway Park runs parallel to the Concord River. The existing trail is owned and managed by the City of Lowell. Lowell Parks and Conservation Trust has been an active partner in the creation of the Greenway since 2000, with support from the Greater Lowell Health Alliance who have funded work in trail connectivity. The Greenway is special for many reasons. A big one is the connectivity for both recreational use and animal use through nature corridors. The Greenway already connects to Shedd Park and Fort Hill Park and will eventually connect those places to the cemeteries and trail network downtown. In the future, the goal is to connect the Greenway to the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail. For animals, riverine connectivity is so important. There are species of fish that depend on the connectivity of these rivers to complete their life cycles. An example would be a species of herring called the owlwife. Owlwife migrate between freshwater and saltwater to complete their life cycle. They are therefore considered a diagemous fish species. Low Parks and Conservation Trust helps to monitor these fish as they pass over the fish ladder at Wamasit Falls. When you visit the Concord River Greenway, you'll notice how many bird species love it here. During this time of year, you may spot a red-winged blackbird who prefers to nest along wetlands. If you're lucky, you may see a pair of Canada geese with their babies. These babies are called goslings. In April and May, spring water runoff creates increased rapids in the Concord River. These rapids can increase to class 3 or 4 rapids. Because of this, Lowell Parks and Conservation Trust partners every year with Zor Outdoor to provide a unique urban whitewater rafting experience down the river. There are a variety of riverine and wetland loving tree species along the shore of the Concord River. You'll be able to see many river birches with their trunks growing straight out of the water. Their habitats range from river banks to riparian forests to lake shores. These trees are special as they are on the watch list for Massachusetts and are considered rare and threatened in the bordering state of New Hampshire. Right up over the trail we have a box elder which is actually in the maple family. Upon closer inspection you can see that this is actually a compound leaf. It has similar maple shapes up at the top here, this, this, uh, this first leaf. But this is actually considered, this whole thing here, from my fingers down, the entire leaf. This is another view of the box elder leaf and its trunk. is an illustrative depiction of the box elder leaf. The leaf is compound and usually made up of three smaller leaflets. Box elders prefer moist soils and is therefore commonly found along riverbanks, lakes, and swamps. also be able to find silver maples along the Greenway Trail. A defining characteristic of the silver maple is the pale silvery underside to the leaf. The tree itself, when it's young, has a light gray bark and as it grows the bark becomes shaggy and scaly. Silver maples also prefer moist soils and can be found along stream banks and floodplains. There is so much to discover at the Greenway. 
Thank you so much for joining me as we took this tour along the Concord River and created this event map for the Greenway Park. As always, if you create any nature journals or event maps of your own, please send a photo into Lowell Parks and Conservation Trust. Again, it's Emily, environmental educator with Lowell Parks and Conservation Trust. Uh, today I will be talking about solitary pollinators, specifically solitary bees. Many of us have heard of bumblebees or honeybees who live in a hive and produce honey. Solitary bees do not live in a hive and they do not produce honey. Um, as the name suggests, they live uh, solitary lives. Um, they typically nest near each other but not in the same exact site. Uh, the few types of bees I will be talking about today are one, the carpenter bees, two, sweat bees, and three, mason bees. Carpenter bees have a bit of a bad reputation. When you search carpenter bees on the internet, you come across countless ways to get rid of them. That being said, carpenter bees are still important pollinators. Carpenter bees are similar in size to bumblebees. The main difference visually is their shiny, hairless abdomen. They also have unique, shallow mouth parts and therefore specialize in specific pollination tasks. For example, carpenter bees are the sole pollinators for passion flowers. The female carpenter bee creates the nest while the male stands guard. The males have been known to charge if you go too close to the nesting cavity. That being said, this display is all for show. The males don't even have stingers. The females do have stingers, though they are still considered docile and only sting if provoked. There are many different kinds of sweat bee. They are known to be blue and green in coloration with pale gold hairs. If spotted in full sunlight, you might describe a sweat bee as pale gold and fuzzy. The one I chose to highlight for you has a bold green blue coloration. They get their common name because they have been known to lick sweat off of humans. They are assumed to do this for the salt. Even with the sweat bee's bold nature, they are highly unlikely to sting. These bees nest in decaying wood and under bark, and often choose to nest in existing insect holes. Because of their chosen nesting sites, they make great forest pollinators. That being said, they can also pollinate crops adjacent to their nesting sites. They are considered generalist pollinators and frequent many different types of flowers, including inconspicuous flowers such as the walnut. Have any of you ever seen this colorful little bee before? Last but not least, I'd like to highlight the blue mason bee. Mason bees themselves make up 25% of the world's bee population. This species nests in reeds and other natural holes, which makes it a great option for solitary bee hotels. The mason bee gets its name because it uses mud to plug up their nesting cavity, just like a brick mason building a house. The mason bee uniquely carries pollen on the underside of its abdomen and pollinates flowers each time it lands. The blue mason bee rarely stings, and even if it does, the venom is very mild, which makes it an ideal beekeeping bee. joining me on this solitary pollinator journey. I hope you learned a little bit about some of our very special and important solitary pollinators.
Hello, my name is Emily and I work for the Lowell Parks and Conservation Trust. We are here at West Meadow and today we will be going on a little tour doing some basic plant ID together as well as creating an event map for this beautiful natural area. When you first walk into West Meadow, you'll be greeted by some common bracken fern. Uh, these ferns are facultative upland species, which means you will find them in uplands as opposed to lowland location. What's special about West Meadow is that you will be seeing both upland and lowland habitat and species that are specific to those areas. Moving on down the path, we are already seeing species that prefer wetland habitats or lowland habitats. Uh, the first of which is sensitive fern, which is my personal favorite fern. Uh, let's get a bit closer. Um, what's unique about this plant um, is this interesting midrib leaf, um, which makes it pretty easy to ID when compared to other ferns. Also in the winter, um, they have a fertile frond that stays up all year round, so uh, you can ID them even in the winter. I don't see one uh, right here, but uh, see if I can find one later in the video. Um, the only other species that has this uh, fertile frond that lives in the same area that will stay up all year round is um, uh, ostrich fern, but that fertile frond tends to be a lot bigger, and um, when it is leafing out, um, the leaves look a lot different, so you don't have to worry about mixing up that ID. The second facultative wetland species I want to show you down here is the cinnamon fern. Um, as you can see, it is the dominant fern species in the understory in this natural area. A cinnamon fern gets its name um, because of the cinnamon, often cinnamon colored fluff along the stem of the plant. Doesn't smell like cinnamon, um, but it do sure does look like it. are at West Meadows Vernal Pool site. At this point in the year, the water is pretty dried up, but this was completely full. You might see that blue jay in the back. Uh, but a couple weeks ago, this was completely full with water. Uh, these habitats are super important, important for species such as frogs and salamanders. Uh, they lay their eggs in vernal pools, just like this one. Uh, so they're super important for conservation and we are very lucky to have them here. Uh, have this one at West Meadow. Around this time of year, you might see fiddlehead ferns at the grocery store. Um, a fiddlehead refers to the point in time when a fern is unfurling. This is the fiddlehead of a cinnamon fern. Uh, that being said, not every fiddlehead is edible. The main one harvested is um, called ostrich fern. Um, some kinds of lady ferns can be harvested as well as bracken fern. Uh, you wouldn't want to eat cinnamon fern or some others. As you can see, this is covered with those cinnamon-esque hairs. Um, that wouldn't be too good to eat. As you walk along the path at West Meadow, there are plenty of animal signs. As you can see, something's been digging up along in the pine needles for grubs. Um, you can hear tons of birds here. Last time I was here, uh, I saw a white-tailed deer, deer only about 10 meters away from me. You'll never know what you find at West Meadow. A little bit farther up the path, we find ourselves in an upland area. Very sunny, very dry today. Um, and we are seeing a lot of pines. Um, and I'll show you how to tell the difference between two species we have here. Um, over to my left, I have an eastern white pine 
and I know this because in the bundle of pine needles, there are five thin needles. Um, and that is a characteristic of white pines and how you can remember that is there are five needles and in the word white, there are five letters. Over to my other side, right next door, we have another kind of pine and looking at this bundle of needles, we have three much thicker, longer kind of spindly needles and I believe that this is a pitch pine um, because of the location, um, the needles, uh, and the bark of some of the bigger pines. down the trail back in the forest now and I've come across an interesting plant uh, right in here. Some of you might recognize this as sweet fern. Surprisingly, uh, despite the common name, it is not a fern. Um, it gets its name because of the leaves that might resemble those in the fern family, um, but it's not a fern. Um, but it does get its name because it smells sweet. Some of the other plant species you might find on a walk here is Canada Mayflower, which litter the forest floor in cute little leaves. And right now they're blooming with white flowers. Um, right next door is the leaf whorl of a star flower. These also bloom white and are blooming around this time of year. Some of you might come across this plant and think it's a maple tree. This is actually called maple leaf viburnum. A little different. As I mentioned earlier, this is a sensitive fern. And down here is the fertile fern stalk. It is darker in color. And as I mentioned previously, this lasts, um, this stays up through the winter. Um, and look, some uh, wood sorrel hanging out down there as well. Can you see that? Beautiful. Thank you for joining me for my creation of an event map for West Meadow and joining me on my walk through the woods. Uh, this is truly a beautiful natural area with a lot to discover and look at. Every time you come back, you'll see something different depending on the time of year or even time of day. Uh, different critters might be out and about. So thank you again for joining me. Um, if you do end up coming here, please feel free to share with us what you find and discover and keep up those nature journals.